This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Good afternoon, my name is James Jordan, and I am the manager of diversity outreach for the Stanford Alumni Association. And I want to welcome you all back to campus, to alums, and for staff and faculty. Thank you for attending this very special occasion. My duty this afternoon is to, produce, to introduce our program host, Goodwin Liu, member of the class of 1991. Goodwin Liu is the Associate Dean and Professor of Law at UC Berkeley's Bolt Hall School of Law, specializing in constitutional law, education policy, civil rights, and the Supreme Court. He is also co-director of the Chief Justice Earl Warren Institute on Race, Ethnicity, and Diversity, a multidisciplinary research center at UC Berkeley devoted to issues of racial justice in California and the nation. Before joining the Bolt faculty in 2003, Professor Lou clerked for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the US Supreme Court and served as special assistant to the Deputy Secretary of, Secretation, Sec, Sec, Deputy Secretation, Sec, Secretary of Education. <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. Deputy Secretary of Education during the Clinton administration. Professor Liu is a Rhodes Scholar and a graduate of Yale Law School and serves on the board of directors of the National Women's Law Center the American Constitution Society, and the Public Welfare Foundation. Mr. Liu joined the Stanford Board of Trustees in March of this year and has served as chair of the Haas Center for Public Service National Advisory Board and as a member of the Stanford Alumni Association Board of Directors and the Task Force on Minority Alumni Relations. Please join me in welcoming Goodwin Liu. Thank you, James, for the nice introduction, and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, as a Stanford alum uh, who now teaches at Cal, uh, let me say it's nice to be back at Stanford. <laughs> and it is especially nice uh, to be part of what I think of as one of the university's finest hours. Those of you who were just at the last session know that that was a very tough act to follow but I assure you that this part of the program is up to the task. You know, as we sit here today in the first decade of the 21st century, it's very commonplace to uh, hear people talk about excellence and diversity going together, hand in hand. In many places, this is an aspiration. At Stanford, it is becoming a way of life. And there's no better example of the confluence between excellence and diversity than the four individuals we are here to honor today. On behalf of the Asian American Activities Center, the Black Community Services Center, El Centro Chicano, and the Native American Cultural Center, as well as the Stanford Alumni Association, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 14th Annual Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Today, we recognize the accomplishments and contributions of Stanford's most distinguished alumni from the Asian American, African American, Chicano, Latino, and Native American communities. The inductees from each community center comprise the members of the Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame. The individuals we honor today, like those who came before them, exemplify what is best about Stanford. Induction to the Hall of Fame is a recognition of career success and individual accomplishment, as well as outstanding contributions to our society and our world. If you haven't done so already, uh, please take a moment before you leave today to browse the names uh, of the Hall of Fame inductees located in the business center of the alumni, uh, of the alumni center here. It's a humbling experience. 
Through their exceptional accomplishments and personal examples, the members of the Hall of Fame bring honor to their communities and to the university as a whole. We are very proud that they are part of the Stanford family. The four honorees this afternoon will be presented by the four directors of Stanford's Ethnic Community Centers. And because we want to make sure that everyone has enough time to speak, I would like to remind the directors and the inductees to be mindful of our time. Uh, we don't have music like they do at the Oscars, so I will pay attention to the clock and keep us on track through what I know will be a very moving and memorable hour. So let's begin. Our first inductee is Dr. France Cordova, a member of the class of 1969. She will be presented by Dr. Francis Morales, the Associate Dean of Students and Director of El Centro Chicano. Francis. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos a la Universidad de Stanford. My name is Francis Morales and I am Associate Dean of Students and Director of El Centro Chicano. It is an honor to say a few introductory remarks about El Centro's inductee to the Multicultural Hall of Fame. Dr. Fran Franz N. Cordova has served as the 11th president of Purdue University since July 16, 2007, and is the first woman to ever lead the university in its 140-year history. Prior to joining Purdue, Dr. Cordova served as chancellor at the University of California, Riverside from 2002 to 2007. She was the first Latina woman to lead a UC campus. Dr. Cordova was also a distinguished professor of physics and astronomy at UC Riverside. An internationally recognized astrophysicist, Dr. Cordova also served as professor of physics and vice chancellor for research at UC Santa Barbara. Before joining UC Santa Barbara in 1996, she was the chief scientist at NASA from 1993 to 1996, serving as a primary scientific advisor to the NASA administrator and the principal interface between NASA headquarters and the broader scientific community. Dr. Cordova is the oldest of 12 children. When asked about a favorite childhood memory, Dr. Cordova recalls the singing the family fight song on summer driving vacations. The song identified each of the 12 siblings so that the family could see if anyone was missing. <laughs> so maybe she will sing the song to us today. She also helped with family chores such as ironing school uniforms for her younger siblings. In 1969, Dr. Cordova graduated cum laude with a bachelor's degree in English from Stanford University. Dr. Cordova conducted anthropological fieldwork in a Zapotec Indian pueblo in Oaxaca, Mexico. When asked about her favorite Stanford memories, one of them was practicing rock climbing with other women friends using door jams at Story House. And she still enjoys rock climbing these days. Ten years after graduating from Stanford, Dr. Cordova earned a PhD in physics from the California Institute of Technology. Although she did not have a science major when she entered the PhD program, she was one of the few students from her cohort to complete a PhD in physics. You may ask, how does one go from an English major to a PhD in physics? Dr. Cordova had an intense interest in physics as a young child, but was not encouraged to pursue a career in science. Her parents had not heard of Stanford when she got accepted. After watching the news coverage of the first landing on the moon by Neil Armstrong, and later a documentary about the discovery of neutron stars, Dr. Cordova went back to school and earned her PhD in physics. Dr. Cordova balances several priorities, several priorities in her life. One of these is her family. She is married to Mr. Christian J. Foster, a science educator at Princeton, I mean at Purdue. She, they have two children in college, Stephen Cordova Foster, sitting right here, a junior at Stanford University, and, also, and majored in management science and engineering. They also have a daughter, Anne Catherine Foster, currently pursuing a master's in education at UC Riverside. Tomorrow, Dr. Cordova will be inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Boston. She's the only faculty from Purdue to ever receive this honor. It is my honor now to present to you Dr. Franz Cordova. Thank you very much for that wonderful and generous introduction. And 
And good afternoon, everyone. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you very, very much for this award. I'm always deeply moved to be back at Stanford. I feel especially honored to be in the company of the other awardees, one of whom is Michael Drake, who is a dear friend and colleague. He advised me when I was chancellor at UC Riverside early on in our quest to bring to UC Riverside the first medical school west of the Mississippi in 45 years. And we were successful in that quest in no small part due to the help and mentorship, the advice of Ma Michael Drake. So I thank you, Michael, for that. The Inland Empire thanks you. It's humbling to note the previous awardees, many of whom I know personally. They comprise a formidable group of role models. Probably none of us, certainly not I, would have thought when we were ordinary students on this beautiful campus a long time ago, doing our studying and our playing and hitting the books in the stacks, enjoying the nightlife, that we would ever be a role model ourselves. I don't think there's any greater honor than being acknowledged by your own campus because it says that you didn't turn out so badly after all. As Francis Morales said, with me are my husband, Chris Foster, who has been a tremendous support and a wonderful friend for 24 years, and our son, Stephen, a junior at Stanford. It's very special to have my child see my alma mater through his eyes and experience the extraordinary teaching and the high quality of friendships that I did. It gives us a bond that transcends the time since I was a student on this campus. This award has to do with accomplishment, um, but it has a lot to do with identity, and so I wanted to just briefly say a few words about identity. I never heard the word Latino growing up. I was just another child from a large family in Southern California, as you heard, the oldest of 12 children who babysat a lot of younger siblings and studied hard because I really liked learning. All I ever wanted to do was explore new things and places. I was the first girl from my high school to be accepted to Stanford, and my parents had never heard of it. While a student, I studied in Italy at the Florence campus. I did research, as you heard, in Mexico. I visited and wrote about Israel as a college guest editor of a New York magazine. I thought of myself as a contemplative vagabond. I became a department head at Penn State, chief scientist of NASA, vice chancellor for research at UC Santa Barbara, all without the word Latina being associated with me. It was the time. And then in 2002, I was named chancellor of UC Riverside, and the LA Times ran a headline with Latina named chancellor of Riverside campus. I had maybe expected something like former NASA chief scientist to take helm at UC Riverside. Yet California's demography had changed since I was a young girl. Immigration had changed its face and its ethnic identity had become important to many who wanted a voice. I felt fortunate to be at UC Riverside, the most diverse of UC's 10 campuses. And over the years, I learned a lot from my students about the aspirations, culture, and sociology and politics of race and identity and ethnicity. My main goal there was that all students, regardless of background, would be equally successful. And I believe that this is what UC Riverside has achieved. That's what the statistics on retention and graduation show that it has achieved. I read 
that in Barack Obama's book about his father, he had a conversation with an African historian whose daughter spoke many languages. The historian finally gave up trying to teach her daughter to speak her African language properly, saying, I'm less interested in a daughter who's authentically African than one who is authentically herself. I think that captures my own quest perfectly, a search for an authentic identity. I answer to many names, Latina, soccer mom, university president, wife, astrophysicist, yet none completely describes me. I'm not a role model for all Latinas, just as I'm not a role model for all soccer moms or all university presidents. I am what I've always been, which is a person who is exploring new ideas, new places, new ways of trying to synthesize my experiences, my knowledge, and my dreams. That is my identity. Thank you for recognizing me. Our second inductee this afternoon is Henry Durr. Henry received his bachelor's degree from Stanford in 1968 and returned to Stanford for his master's degree in 2000. I'm especially pleased to see Henry get this award. As I remember very fondly, he was an important friend and mentor to me when I was a student at Stanford. He'll be presented by Cindy Ng, the Associate Dean for students, of Students and Director of the Asian American Activities Center. Cindy? Thank you, Goodwin, and good afternoon. When I first contacted Henry uh, to let him know that he had been selected as our 2008 inductee into the Hall of Fame, his response was atypical for someone who has been honored quite often. He said, Thank you for thinking about me, but I'm not sure that what I've done in the community or professionally has been exceptional. I view what I've done as something another individual would have done in the same circumstance. And this is precisely why Henry continues to receive recognition, because clearly what motivates him is not personal recognition, but a deep commitment to civil and human rights. For Henry, to serve is just the right thing to do. Henry was born in San Francisco Chinatown, the sixth of nine children. He grew up in Stockton in the 50s and 60s in the midst of a changing America. The civil rights movement had a profound effect on the son of immigrants who knew what it was to struggle, to make a life in a land where the culture and language were foreign. As a high school student, he witnessed more privileged parents protesting when separate but equal was struck down and children were bused to a school in the less affluent part of town. He learned then that equal access to a quality education was something he would continue to fight for. At the urging of his high school counselor, he applied for and was accepted to Stanford. After graduating, he made his way to Chinese for Affirmative Action, where he quickly became executive director. For the next 22 years, Henry built CAA as a leading advocacy organization for the Asian American community, with particular focus on the needs of low-income, Im immigrant, and limited English-speaking individuals. Under his leadership, CAA fought for equal access to health, education, and social services for those with lim limited English proficiency. Bilingual ballots in San Francisco increased hiring of Asian Pacific American police officers, bilingual 911 office operators, and the passage of the Equal Access to Services Ordinance to ensure services to non-English speaking San Franciscans are just a few of CAA's successful initiative during Henry's tenure. In 1996, when Delane Easton became California's superintendent of public instruction, she tapped Henry to be part of her team as deputy superintendent. She selected Henry because, in her words, I was looking for someone who could help shift the focus of the Department of Education to student achievement, especially for disadvantaged students. Henry became the point person for at-risk students throughout the state, working to close the educational gap for low-income and immigrant students and students of color. 
After leaving the Department of Education, Henry lent his talents to the field of philanthropy. As a senior program officer for the Haas Junior Fund's Equality and Justice Program, he focused on race and immigrant issues. He is currently a senior program officer with the Four Freedoms Fund, a national funders collaborative that supports immigrant rights. For a lifetime dedicated to service and advocacy for immigrant rights and equal opportunities in education, employment, and social services, it is an honor to induct Henry Durr into the Asian American Activity Center Hall of Fame. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cindy, for such a nice uh, introduction. Indeed, it is an honor uh, to be uh, recognized this afternoon with uh, distinguished uh, alums of this university uh, for uh, our work after leaving this university. I have to admit that during my undergraduate years here at Stanford University, I had a very uh, mixed experience, uh, to say it generously. Um, it was a very turbulent time. Uh, the war in Vietnam was a, a major challenge for those of us on this campus. Uh, and also, during my undergraduate years, uh, there was no ethnic or racial consciousness on this campus. Uh, you could literally count the number of racial minorities on a couple of hands. And I remember very well that uh, after the year that I came here in 19, fall of 1964, the following year was really the first uh, major effort by this university to include African-American students. And it was a very telling time because the terminology, the consciousness may have resided in some of us individually but it was not acknowledged or talked about in a very broad way here on this campus. So it was, uh, it was a time of, of, of learning, but also trying to find out uh, who we are, what we wanted to do, and how we could make a difference. So it was not unusual for those of us um, who were not affiliated with the student organizations that exist at this time, that we would gravitate to a protest rally by Kenny Washington and others about the lack of black, uh, black studies here on campus. And uh, when I look at my undergraduate experience uh, during that very turbulent time, I can say one thing. There was one course that I found to be profoundly practical and useful. And that was in my senior year in the, in the curriculum, they offered Swahili. <laughs> and before I came here as an undergraduate, it had been my life, it had been my dream and, and uh, goal to serve in the Peace Corps doing public service work. And it was a time of great excitement during the early 60s because of, uh, of uh, uh, the African countries going through uh, independence and liberation. And I knew that I wanted to go to Africa. And lo and behold, in my senior year, they offered Swahili. I quickly enrolled in the course, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It really helped me to survive Peace Corps training. Um, and I went halfway around the world to engage in public service. And since that time to now, I feel that life has not changed for me because it has always been about how we can make a difference in whatever we may do. And as Cindy indicated in her introduction of me, in the last several years, I've had the distinct privilege and honor to work in the funding community to support local and state and national organizations across these United States who are fighting for the rights of immigrants in our country. There is no single social, civil rights, and human rights challenge today that can match the broken, 
national immigration system here in the United States. We absolutely have to do something to make whole the 12 million undocumented immigrants in our country. They have become the fodder of political rhetoric, of hate, and racial profiling. And in the last two to three years, I've been literally inspired by the thousands and hundreds of immigrant uh, members of our community marching the streets, standing up for their rights, and saying, we have voices that need to be heard. That notwithstanding the political debate about a legalization, about enforcement, about security, uh, terrorism, immigrants, whether they're legal or undocumented, deserve to be treated like human beings. And policymakers need to understand <laughs> policymakers need to understand that in DC they can talk about all these policies and building a 700 mile wall, and they, in the meanwhile, forget that there are real people, real communities that live along the border, that have taken great strides to sacrifice to come to this country, legal or otherwise, because they want to take care of their families. And just earlier this week, I had the privilege to be in El Paso, Texas, visiting the border area. And that community is united in its opposition to the wall. They are united to say that people need to be treated with dignity and respect. And it is to their credit there's that state, local, federal officials, and even the police are united that local law enforcement should not enforce immigration laws. It's those voices that need to be heard. And I'm really privileged, and I feel like uh, 40 years ago uh, that I, I'm surprised that I still have the same level of enthusiasm and energy because when you listen to the voices of people who have been disadvantaged, they want to be heard and if we give them an opportunity to be heard, they will speak with great confidence, eloquence, and passion about their lives, their families, and their dreams. So I thank you very much for this recognition because as I really don't feel that I've really done anything particular because in working with people in the community, I feel that I have the privilege to learn something new every day, that it's our job to make sure that the powers to be, the policymakers in DC, hear the voices of the people so that we have a better America today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Our third inductee this afternoon is Dr. Michael Drake, class of 1971. He'll be presented by Jan Barker Alexander, Associate Dean of Students and Director of the Black Community Services Center. Jan? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I think it's very appropriate that I followed the last honoree. When I look at everyone's year of graduation, starting with Dr. Mamaday, 60, 63. So he really was here when no one else was here. And I look at Mr. Durr, 68. I look at Dr. Cordova, 69. And I look at Dr. Drake, 71. Before this event, there was an event in this room celebrating the students from 1968 who took the mic. And quick about that story. Four days after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, the university canceled classes and sp sponsored a university-wide convocation. It was entitled Colloquium and Plan for Action, Stanford's Response to White Racism. 
During the comments from Provost Richard Lyman, approximately 70 students from the Black Student Union somberly walked down the aisles, walked on stage, and as we know in this community, took the mic from the provost. They then issued 10 demands of this institution concerning its responsibility to black students and other minority students at Stanford. It is very fitting that we are in this room today after that program to see what Stanford and what people who have attended Stanford have accomplished. I think that I'm very struck by Dr. Mr. Durr's comments because he called out the names of people who were pushing the envelope. And we can all see that you are truly pushing the envelope in this country at this time. And we thank you for that. Now, these alums set a stage of social justice, which brings me to our inductee, Dr. Michael Drake. So you can clearly read his bio. Chancellor, leadership, visionary, all of these things. You can see what's happening at UC Irvine under his watch. They're starting a law school. They're building a hospital. They're doing, and as young people like to say, he's doing big things. <laughs> Now what I want to say about Michael, and I talked to your staff first, and they said all the words about being a leader and being a visionary, but they also said that he's attentive. He's attentive to us. He cares about us. He's concerned about our welfare. We know that he is a busy man because of everything he has to do, but he takes time out to spend time with us weekly, and I think the provost is in the room, and I think he would say, that is a big deal, Michael, weekly to spend time with his staff to see how things are going because he is a man of passion and compassion. When we first, I got the word that we would be inducting Michael, I began to think about how I know Michael. I know Michael, as you know, Dr. Drake, but I know Michael the family man, Michael the Stanford family man. And when I say Stanford family man, I mean that literally. Michael, Brenda, and their two sons, Chris and Sean, all Stanford graduates. That deserves a round of applause. <laughs> now, I want to also mention the other part of Michael that I've come to learn, that I've come to know. And that would be Michael the romancer. Now, what do I mean by that? Michael actually met his wife, Brenda, in a class taught by Dr. St. Clair Drake, who was the first chair of the African and African American Studies Department. The class was Urbanization of African Societies. So to the students in the audience, here is proof, scholarship, academics, and romance do connect in some way here at Stanford University. Michael the family man, the Stanford family man. Michael and Brenda have been consistent in their support of Stanford, whether it's been through the parents board, hosting admissions receptions, volunteering at events, and other boards. But what I remember most, Brenda and Michael opened their home to the Black Community Services Center for one of our very first fundraising events because they understood where we sat in history. They were very supportive of us in that drive. Now, I will say this about Michael. His love for this institution is evident. You can see what he has accomplished, and I think that he would give credit to Stanford University for certain things. But he would also look back at all of these communities of color and how they have supported him along the way and the black community in supporting him along the way. What I respect about Michael is he also turns it back. He knows that he, too, supports the community now that supported him. I'd like to present to you Dr. Michael Drake.
Thanks very much, Jan. I appreciate that. That was uh, very, very kind. I, uh, it's very nice to see so many people, so many people who I knew uh, 40 years ago, and then other people who I've worked with in the years, years in between. Particularly France, when you were talking. France and I worked very closely together when we were chancellors together, and then when I was vice president before that. And I was thinking your speech was so eloquent and thoughtful, I was hoping perhaps you would loan it to me and I would just read it. It was. Uh, it was very nice. You also said that you had read uh, Barack Obama's book, and that we don't, I don't want to be political, but uh, I read Sarah Palin's book. It was, it was a very quick read. No, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> okay, I'm ever so sorry. Only kidding. <laughs> Only kidding. Uh, so uh, a few things I, I have been thinking about today, actually, and I'd like to uh, share for the moment. First, thanks very much to the Black Community Services Center and for everyone for supporting this event and many other events that take place uh, here on the campus. I've been to this room many times, and uh, over the last uh, several years, our, both of our sons, as Jan mentioned, are alums, and uh, we're very pleased that the uh, Black Community Services Center has an award ceremony for students who have achieved at a very high level at the end of each year. And uh, we were here each of the years that any of our boys were in school, and so I've been in this room. I was here seven years uh, in a row. Uh, they uh, overlapped one year. And so I, this is a room that has very fond memories uh, for me, and I'm very pleased to be here. And also, I was thinking as I drove down today about the first time I came to campus and all the things that have happened between. I was here as a student and loved that. I, as a professor at UCSF, came and lectured here as an alum. We came to football games and basketball games with the boys as they grew up. I appreciated that. Um, and, and then uh, uh, have come back uh, many other occasions as a member of the parent board, etc. And uh, there are always pleasant memories coming back to the farm. Uh, and today, uh, coming back and thinking about the kinds of things that were going to be spoken of today in the symposium that took place before us, I really was one of those people who benefited from the wave of social change that happened in the late 60s. Uh, particularly the assassination of Dr. King was something I think that was a, a wake-up call for the country that things had to be done uh, not in a, um, the sort of stepwise uh, uh, fashion uh, that the pace of civil rights change had uh, slowed to during the middle part of the, the 60s, but really a more rapid pace. And many of the questions that had been raised in the early 60s that were still lying on the table in the mid-60s, I think, uh, hit our college campuses in the late 60s and led to change that opened opportunities for study for people like myself here at Stanford. And actually then at, at UCSF uh, in the years after I left, I will say a word about some of my colleagues at UCSF where, where I happened to be uh, yesterday. Uh, the UCSF protest that was sort of similar to the taking the mic protest uh, in that same month of April of 1968 was not led by students because actually there weren't students on the campus in any number, three or four students, but not in any number. And so the people who led the, the protest there were the service workers on the campus, the people who pushed brooms and washed dishes and changed beds. And they actually went on strike. They stopped working and had a list of demands that were very similar to the 10 demands that were here. But they, all of their demands were directed at students. They were, uh, I'm sorry, not true. Let me say it right. So they had a series of demands that were directed at themselves and their work life. I one that I'll give you that I, I think uh, explains their circumstances. The, the, the rule was that service workers couldn't eat in the cafeteria or use uh, bathrooms uh, uh, except in the service area. So the people who cooked the food and served the food had to take food down into the basement to eat it. And the people who cleaned the, uh, the bedpans and, and washed the linen had to themselves on break take elevators down to the basement to use the bathroom. So one of the demands that they put forward was that they would be allowed to eat the food that they prepared and allowed to use the bathrooms that they cleaned. But uh, in these kind of uh, very practical demands that they put forward, they also put forward demands that the institution would open itself to educating people of color to take care of the health care needs of the communities that, they, uh, that we all have come from. And so uh, there was a great swell of this kind of consciousness in the world at that time. And um, uh, it's very good to look back on those days and think of the progress we've made, uh, progress yet to, uh, many things that to achieve, but the progress we've made uh, since those days. I uh, taught a course this last spring that was called The Music of the Civil Rights Era. Uh, I'm an ophthalmologist by uh, training, but uh, they're very kind to me at Irvine and allow me to teach courses in uh, disciplines for, uh, in which I'm not um, qualified. So this, 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 was, uh, this was one of those. 
Um, and we, so I taught a course with a co-teacher in music of the civil rights era, and what we had a chance to look at was music and how music was reflecting social change, and we were, the basic premise was that art reflects society and society reflects art, and we were picking, uh, we picked popular music because that's a rapidly changing form of art. But I spent a, a lot of time talking with uh, the kids in the class, like kids, they were um, undergrads, the, the students in the class about the changes of the civil rights era and the kinds of things that were the America of the early 60s uh, that they, can have a hard, they have a hard time imagining when they think of the America that they see today. The diverse and multicultural American campuses that we have today were very different than those of the mid-50s. And then I gave a talk, I mentioned I was at UCSF yesterday, I gave a talk yesterday on global health. And let me ask you, I'll ask you a question that I asked the audience yesterday when we were talking about global health. So the, the question I posed to the audience, and this is, a, this is something for you all to do, is for you to um, uh, imagine for a moment a country in which there's poor health. You can close your eyes if you need to, but just think of a country that you know of in the world that has, sort of, that has poor health. And then think about that country for a moment, and you got that in your mind, and then I'd say, okay, what about the education system in that country? What about the water? What about the roads? What about the security of people? What about the infrastructure? What about the economic future of the people in that country? And all down the line, health is a marker, but all of these things that sort of uh, denote or let us know the status of human rights and, uh, and the status of the people who are living in these countries, all of those things are poor in concert with one another. So I gave a long talk. I talked for about 45 minutes about different parameters and statistics about public health. And then at the end, I said to rethink of the country that you imagine, and you could all do this here, and think about what the people walking down the street in that country look like. And uh, all of you imagine a country where those people are people of color. And so the issues that we talked about in the 60s and that came uh, before the panel today and that we uh, are celebrating uh, uh, today, the progress we've made, that we're celebrating today, these issues really are worldwide issues and issues that uh, affect the lives and the health and the future of people and of, of their children every day. And so the, the, the work that we've done has been terrific and we've made great progress and uh, many of us are privileged to be a part of that. But there still is much, much work to done here in our own communities and, and elsewhere around the world. Uh, two other things to um, say. First, uh, my uh, work in life has been supported uh, tremendously by someone I met here at Stanford. I think of the things that were important about being at Stanford. One most important uh, thing was meeting Brenda. I remember absolutely when and where I met her. And um, uh, one of those clear things that you remember, I remember meeting her actually as a big deal. Uh, it was a big deal to me actually at the time and uh, has been a big deal ever since. I'm sorry, they told me I had to tell the truth, and so I'm doing, I'm doing my best. So I just wanted to make sure to take a, a moment to acknowledge Brenda and the support that she's given to me and uh, to our children as they've grown into young men. I'd like to also mention Panya Lyons, another Stanford grad who's here today, and so we have a whole row of uh, Stanford grads. It's a great thing. And then I'd like, you know, I was, when Henry was talking, I was thinking about the work and what we're doing, what the point of it all is, and, and it reminds me of something I love to share to groups. It's a very short poem. Uh, that I think helps to describe how we maintain enthusiasm. I was asked by one of my former residents yesterday in the talk, was I as optimistic and enthusiastic today as I was when I was uh, an intern 30 years ago? And I said mostly, and, uh, uh, and that's because of something that I, I think is a, a poem that kind of describes what makes this work so exciting and makes it such a, a privilege. And it's a poem by uh, Tagore, the Indian poet from the 19th century. It's very simple, and it is, I slept and dreamt of joy. I awoke to find a life of service. I lived my life to learn that service is joy. Thank you all very much. Our fourth inductee this afternoon is Dr. Scott Momaday, who received his MA in 1960 and his PhD from Stanford in 1963. He'll be presented by Winona Sims, Associate Dean of Students and Director of the Native American Cultural Center, Dr. Momade is unable to be here today, and Dr. Kenneth Fields, professor of English here at Stanford, will accept the award on his behalf. Winona? Hingsje Gochala Yujiha Peskogiha Di. Greetings, and thank you for thinking of In Scott Mama Day with us today. There was a house made of dawn. It was made of pollen and of rain, 
and the land was very old and everlasting. There were many colors on the hills, and the plain was bright with different colored clays and sands, red and blue, and spotted horses grazed in the plain. And there was a dark wilderness on the mountains beyond. The land was still and strong. It was beautiful all around. These are the first lines from House Made of Dawn that articulates the beauty of Indian territorial lands in the Southwest and the rich variety of Native American Indian people in their element. In 1969, when N. Scott Mamaday won the Pulitzer Prize for House Made of Dawn, the elation in the hearts of Native American people everywhere, and especially in the hearts of those living in Oklahoma, soared to the heavens. Mama Day was the first Native American Indian, the first Kiowa to be so honored. And he will remain to many of us a hero and an encouragement to all those who aspire to right of their Native heritage and the all too frequent conflicts of living in more than one culture. The Kiowa word for in Scott Mama Day would be Segi, which means uncle, which is an honored title. His list of accomplishments are numerous. He graduated from the University of New Mexico in 1959 with a BA. He remained there to teach on an Apache reservation. He received his master's in 1960 from Stanford, his PhD in 1969. He's been on the faculty at the Universities of California, Santa Barbara and Berkeley, and Stanford, and the University of Arizona. In 2007, he became Oklahoma's 16th Poet Laureate and recipient of the National Medal of Arts and National Humanities Medal. He is the founder and chairman of the Buffalo Trust, a nonprofit foundation for the preservation and restoration of Native American culture and heritage in the American Southwest, Oklahoma, Alaska, and Siberia. Most recently, Dr. Mamaday served as one of the faculty leaders of the Stanford Alumni Association's Trans-Siberian Rail College Tour. I would now like to yield the rest of my time to Dr. Ken Fields, who will accept on behalf of Dr. Mamaday, who could not be here today due to a great and deep loss. I give you Dr. Fields. Thank you. It's an honor to um, be asked to accept this award for uh, Scott Mamaday, who is a uh, a former colleague and an old friend, um, and one of the most famous, justly famous writers on the planet. I've known Scott for 45 years. Um, I knew his wife. I know I don't look that old. Thank you. Um, I uh, I I knew his wife Barbara uh, for nearly as long. Uh, she died about 10 days ago or two weeks ago. Or Scott would be here. I know. Um, I thought I'd bring him to life a little bit by um, a couple of stories. Uh, one now is sort of in the oral tradition. Uh, it, it's, it's not clear if it happened, but I believe that it did. I know that Scott was here at a certain point when Ken Kesey was here, and they were doing a reading together, and Kesey was reading from uh, what became One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, a wonderful book. and. He said rather flippantly, I want to read you a passage about a crazy Indian. And, uh, and Scott got up and, uh, to read from his, uh, I don't know what he was reading from, maybe his poems, and he said, well, I'm an Indian, and I'm not crazy. <laughs> um, so that was Scott. At least he wasn't crazy that night. 
I heard him uh, uh, in a reading here at Stanford a long time ago during the question period. And you always get strange questions in the question period. You know, you just hold your breath. And some young students said, what does it feel like to be an Indian with a PhD? And uh, Scott said, um, well, it feels pretty good. Oh, well, some days better than others, you know how it is. <laughs> uh, that's really Scott, that's that he talks in one of his great books about the sense of play, and he was a very grave, he's a very grave man, big man with a great big voice, but he has that, uh, that sense of play as well. When he was here at Stanford too, he was asked to come out and speak to some little kids. I think maybe it was a school in East Palo Alto, and it could have been a kindergarten or a preschool. And he started by all the kids were sitting on the floor waiting for him to talk, and he said, I'm going to tell you a story that's very old. It goes back to a time when dogs could talk. And a little boy on the floor said, oh, those were the days. An ideal audience for anybody, but certainly for Scott, because one of his lifelong projects, and I think best expressed in The Way to Rainy Mountain, which is a book like no other book I know, is how to bring something to life that has deteriorated. That is, in his case, it was the history and sort of psyche of the Kiowas. And he says in the beginning of that book, that the verbal tradition that held it in place has deteriorated. He says later in that book, I do not speak Kiowa. So how does, now he speaks more Kiowa now, that was a long time ago, and he, he knows he speaks some Navajo too. I call him Hustin when I see him, that's what, uh, our version. But um, uh, how do you do that? Uh, well, I, I'm not gonna tell you, I've taught, I've taught that book and his poems every year that I've been at Stanford, and sometimes more than one. So just read the book and find out how, find out how he does it. But in one of the most uh, beautiful poems he has, he has the same kind of um, thing. And because of the occasion of him not being here, I thought I would read this in another poem on a related subject. They're both about death. And the first poem is called Angle of Geese. It is about, um, it's addressed to a friend who's lost his firstborn child. and. And, and the problem that he faces is the problem that any of us faces when you try to say something to somebody. I mean, what do you say? I'm sorry. You say that, but it doesn't quite seem enough. And he says, custom intervenes, we are civil, something more. But then he says, more than language means, the mute presence, that's the death, molds and marks. How is it that a writer who lives by words and is written by the importance of words in his own tradition can deal with a subject that gets beyond words? You'll see in the second half of the poem, it's as if he steps to one side. He starts almost another, it's an example, but he starts it with and as if it naturally follows. And the poem and its procedures, for those of you who care for these things, uh, resembles the Roman poet Horace. At the very end, it resembles Emily Dickinson, and it seems to me pure Kiowa as well. Angle of Geese. How shall we adorn recognition with our speech? Now the dead firstborn will lag in the wake of words. Custom intervenes. We are civil, something more. More than language means the mute presence molds and marks. Almost of a mind, we take measure of the loss. I am slow to find the mere margin of repose. And one November, it was longer in the watch as if forever of the huge ancestral goose. So much symmetry, like the pale angle of time and eternity, the great shape labored and fell. 
quit of hope and hurt. It held a motionless gaze, wide of time, alert on the dark, distant flurry. I'm going to end with that one. Thank you. Well, I told you it would be very moving and memorable. We're so proud of today's inductees. Each of you, in your own way, said, thank you for honoring me. But the fact is that all of you have honored us. On behalf of everyone assembled here, I want to thank the selection committees, the, culture, the community center directors, and the Stanford Alumni Association for the time and effort uh, into this event. Since this is the 21st century, I'm tasked to tell you that an audio recording of this program will be available for download from Stanford iTunes in November. So with that, please join us in the lobby for refreshments, and thank you for being here this afternoon. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.